evening. Welcome. If you guys want to go ahead and stand and join us for our midweek service. Good to see everybody. Let's just, let's just begin in prayer as people make their way in. Father, we just we come to you with open hands and open hearts tonight, God. We love you. We lift up your name, God, in our life. Right here tonight, Jesus, God, let it be a personal time, Lord, as we come corporately as a community, but Lord, let it let you speak to our hearts personally, God. God, that you would have your way, that God, that you would heal those who need to be healed. We ask that you would be with those who are in the hospital, God, those who are feeling alone, those who are feeling weary, those who are feeling tired, Lord, that you would give them strength tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Place. 
that we put him in and we just truly say have your way even if it means a rushing wind even if it means it's uncomfortable even if it means I'm not used to it even if it means it's going to change some things we say have your way let's just sing that chorus one more time have your way have your way have your way
Why don't we go to God in prayer right now? All the needs we have in this building, all those that are sick, some that are watching, traveling. Let's pray right now. If you have a need, just lift it up to Jesus. Father, we thank you for being here already. We don't want the lyrics of this song just to be lyrics combined with a melody, God. We want it to be our cry. Have your way. God, because when your presence is here, there's peace and fullness of joy. There's pleasures. We need you, Jesus. Have your way. Those that are sick tonight, God, touch their bodies. Those that are watching online right now, God, or that will go and watch later, touch them, Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost sit in their room right now, wherever they may be watching, God. Connie Wise, as she lay in the hospital, God, touch her in Jesus' name. Heal her in Jesus' name. Touch this service tonight, God. A Wednesday night, doesn't matter what night or day of the week, God, we expect to hear from you. Every hand that went up, God, let healing virtue flow. Touch us in this house tonight, God. Let the hearts in this room cry out to you. Come on, God, help us to cry out to you, Jesus. Nothing is impossible for you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Before you're seated, I want to give you some announcements. And I think we have Usher tonight, singular. So we'll we'll receive the tithe and offering. But I don't have it. Is this up? Is this up to date up here? Or, or no, it's not. So I'm not giving you anything. I will tell you the wrong stuff to do. No, I'm just kidding. We do have work nights. I know that. So if you can show up, is there something going on up here? Okay, good. If you can show up to work nights, just come. There's usually one or two at least or more here. Sometimes we get lucky and have more than that. Uh, I know they started laying the new carpet tiles in the, is that the crew room? Is that, is that the crew room? The new crew room next door. So they should have that done hopefully this week. And good news, we're having to pay more out of pocket, but um, we should have cross your fingers, hope, pray. We should have electricity in the building by this weekend. So <laughs> that is a big deal. Amen. And I know Al knows what I'm talking about, and Pastor Braden knows, and Garland, these guys that have been up here many, many days. Uh, so electricity is going to be a big deal. That means this whole front side, this whole uh, south side, will all have air conditioning. And then we'll have air conditioning in two of the middle rooms. And we'll still be working on our issue with the three phase to single phase, but we'll get that down. But we're so thankful uh, about all the hard work that's going forth and then the diligence. And we're hoping by uh, August, the first week in August when we do VBS, we'll have a minimum of six rooms uh, ready for VBS. Amen. That should excite somebody. But uh, so we're excited to be able to do that. So please continue to be faithful in giving. Uh, just if you don't mark um, something very specifically on your check, then we make sure it goes to wherever the ministry needs it. Um, so, uh, but we do want you to be faithful to that. And if you made some promises and faith promises, then we want you to live up to that too. That's not between me and you. That's between you and God. So if you said, I'm going to do or I'm going to give, don't come back to me and say, what's he pressuring me for? I'm not pressuring you about anything. If you feel bad, take it up with that guy. Amen. There's not going to be any amens on it, but I'll say amen. Right? A lot of times we get ourselves in trouble, and then we, we start wanting to blame other folk. Sounds like our country, doesn't it? <laughs> it's always somebody else's fault. Never the guy. All right, I'm not going to get that serious. I'm not teaching tonight. So uh, where's that? Uh, there he is back there. He's shorter than everybody in here. So come on up here. Uh, Daniel, we're going to receive the tithe and offering. And so please, be again, be faithful. Those, if I missed an announcement of something coming up, I would encourage you, hopefully it's on the screen and it's scrolling, or it's something you can go and look at online. And I know we got things coming up outside of the things we've already announced um, so, or that I've already told you. So make sure you stay up to date. We'll have a newsletter out there hopefully by Sunday, a new one with all the fresh dates on it. Amen. So Monumental VBS is our main thing. So if you haven't signed up for that, make this microphone. Is this microphone hot? No, you go ahead. I want to blow. No, I'm just kidding. Um, VBS, if you haven't signed up for VBS, there's, I mean, from 
200 years old all the way down. We need help. So that just included all of y'all in here. <laughs> so we need it on every level. It doesn't mean you have to be a crew leader watching kids. That's not just what VBS is. There's a lot of prep. Every year, Sister Karen takes, I think this will be how many years you've been doing the snacks? Many, many years, right? This is our 10th year of VBS. We, we missed just one. Is that right, Jessica? Missed one or two because of, uh, I don't even want to use the word pandemic, but the political pandemic. Um, but anyway, we missed that. But outside of that, we've had one. And so we're, we're excited about that. And I know the kids love Karen. And Connie's been your helper. And she's in the hospital tonight. But she's doing better. So y'all keep Connie wise in your prayers. And if you want to go by and see her, it would lift her. But take you. My dad and I were talking and said, pack a lunch and possibly get a room. <laughs> because it's in Lakeway. <laughs> Anywhere you go over that way, it's traffic. And so, uh, and be prayed up. Make sure you fasted and prayed. Praise the Lord, because you know that everybody else on the planet can't drive when you're driving. Is that right? Amen. Isn't it funny how we always say it's the other driver? Okay, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. Y'all ready to give? Amen. No, that wasn't very enthusiastic. Are y'all ready to give? Amen. We're going to give unto the Lord. Raise it to heaven right now. Father, we give this to you. We ask that you bless it. Multiply it for your kingdom, for your use. Help us, God, to be good stewards of it. Bless the gift, bless the giver. God, those that think they do not have or those that do not have, bless them that they may be a conduit of blessing to others. In Jesus' name, we ask, believe, and pray. And everybody say amen. 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 God bless you as you bring. Thank you, musicians. Thank you, uh, singers. Y'all did a wonderful job. Don't they do a wonderful job every single week? Thank you, Jesus, for faithful people. Thank you. Me and John all agree. Um, so we're not having the breakout class tonight for... Uh, exploring God's Word because I had my, asked my father to come in and I was hoping some other folks would be here but hopefully they're watching. What's that? The youth is in here too? Okay, so the youth is staying here but crew will break out and they'll go to their class and they already know that because they're out. And the rest of y'all can be seated. And so we're so thankful uh, that and we've been so blessed by Pastor Nick and his series on Song of Solomon. Where is he? He's still hanging out back here on Song of Solomon. And I know all of them have been good, but the week, not last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before, I believe was in his top tier game. And his game's always top tier, but this is like top tier of the top tier. You know what I mean? So I, I encourage you to go back and watch that. And if you want to be encouraged, go back and watch Sunday's uh, message that I preached on a limitless God. Because some of us need to understand he is limitless. Amen. And so I'm thankful for my father to accept this. I gave him last-minute notice, but he's always gracious when he's able. And so I'm thankful for him. We're blessed to have elders still in the church preaching the Word of God. Amen? So just say, God bless Pastor Mike East, and give the Lord a hand clap of praise, would you? Come on. Come on. the way I feel about the pulpit. It's all cluttered up with somebody else's stuff. And I have to try and come up there and spread my stuff out. By the time I get it all set, I've lost my train of thought. I'm going to tell you how you know you're getting old. When you tell somebody in the church and you're in the office, if I'm not there when y'all start, Send somebody to wake me. That's how you know things are, are getting a little old. You have been, uh, from what I've, I've heard and read, there's been a lot of uh, talk about baptism lately. And you've been baptizing people. That, that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. Unfortunately, we live in a generation that now has discounted baptism and say that it's, you know, it's a good thing to do, but it's not necessary. And they, they simply encourage people to do it, but there's really not a focus on it. 
And I had a song on my mind all day long. And I told him to put something up there, and he didn't put it yet. There we go. I had told them that I wanted to put a couple of things on this screen tonight. This was the first thing. And I want to read these, and you can read them along with me. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. Now, this is talking about when Moses was having his confrontation with Pharaoh, and all these plagues were being poured out. He says, I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn. Now, when he says all, that means everybody. Everyone's going to feel it. Now, the population of Egypt in that day was in the millions. And so there were a lot of firstborn children, firstborn animals. It said firstborn everything that they were going to die that night. So he said, I'll pass by and I'll strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, in the context of that chapter, he's telling them that you are to take a lamb without a blemish. You're going to kill this lamb and eat it. This is going to be the Passover. And he says, but the blood... You'll take the blood and you'll go on the sides of the doors and you'll, with, with, with a, they call it a hyssop, but it's like a brush. You take it and they paint that, that side of the wall with blood. Sounds gross, doesn't it? But then they'd go across the top too. Why? Because if you entered into the doorway, you had to pass under the blood. And he said, tonight the death angel is going to come through here and there's going to be death everywhere. It's going to be like nothing we've ever imagined before. And he said, that angel is going to kill the firstborn of every creature. But if there's a house that has the blood of the lamb over the doorway and on the side rails, I will pass that house up and no plague will come upon you. And thus the Passover was created. Now in Leviticus 17, it says that the life is in the blood. Without the blood, without the shedding of blood, there cannot be a remission of sins. No matter how much you pray, how much you fast, how much money you may donate, how brilliant you may be, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. So in the Old Testament, your sins were not forgiven. They were simply rolled ahead. They would make sacrifices, blood sacrifices of animals, and then your sins would be rolled ahead for a year. Next year, you got to come back and do the same thing over and over again. Now, Jesus was a sacrificial lamb. In the book of Genesis, when God talks to Adam and Eve, this is a teaching lesson. That's what he said tonight, teach. When he talked to Adam and Eve for their mistakes in the garden, he tells Eve, I'm going, to save the, I'm going to save humankind through you. It's going to go through you. I'm going to use you to save all of mankind. Now, isn't that, isn't that remarkable? He used the woman instead of the man. And he said, I'm going to save all of humankind through her. It will come through her. Salvation will come through her. Now, life is in the blood. Well, I'm going to tell you that Mary did not have the blood of Joseph in her because she had never known a man. So the blood did not come from Joseph. Joseph was his father in name only. Jesus, Jesus could not have a spot of the world in his veins. So the blood that came did not come from Joseph. Jesus said, that I've come that the world, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And life 
is only in the blood. All day long I've been humming this song. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that wa- You're failing me, son. Where's my song? No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So it's, it, it's a pretty clear indication that without the blood, you cannot be saved. Amen. Now what we've done in modern society especially, but it didn't start here. It didn't start in the United States. It didn't start with the secular churches. It started all the way back in the days of Jesus. When he died and resurrected, it was just a few short years later that the church was already headed downhill. Now, we look back at the book of Acts and we say, oh, man, boy, they really had it going. They did. But the moment the book of Acts, in that early chapters of book of Acts, they started a downhill grade. After those apostles were dead and gone, it wasn't but 200 years later that the Catholic church was formed and water baptism was changed. They didn't obey what the scripture said. They changed it. The Britannica Encyclopedia, World Book Encyclopedia, any reference you want to call on will tell you that baptism was changed from what the Bible said to what the church of that day wanted to do. They did not want to immerse people because it was a hassle. People didn't want to get in the water. Let's let this, let's make this thing simple. We've got to make it palatable. We've got to make it to where people will want to do it. So we'll just get a little bowl of water, like a doggy bowl, and stick our fingers in it and zip. We'll just sprinkle a lid on you and, and you all set. Yeah. Well, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. How do I get that blood into my life? How, what do I need to do that, that I know that the blood has been applied to my life? I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to talk about it. The blood can only be applied to your life through water baptism. That's the only way. The moment you are baptized in water, immersed in water, the Bible said it's a death that takes place. There's a sacrifice that takes place. And when you come up out of that water, you rise to walk in the newness of life, Baptism is where the blood is put into your life and your sins are remitted at that moment. Acts 2.38 said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The remission, that means that a debt is canceled out. That means that something's taken away. There's no longer a penalty. There's no longer a charge. The moment you get in the water and go under in the name of Jesus Christ, all your sins are canceled out. All your old, dark, dirty, nasty life is raced in a one moment, one moment of that water baptism in Jesus name what we have done very effectively we started changing methods we went from immersion to sprinkling then we went from well if you want to do it do it and if you don't want to do it don't do it doesn't matter because you're saved by grace you understand you're saved by grace what scripture says that and see John three sixteen says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can I tell you, that scripture is absolutely true. Absolutely 100% true. But can I tell you also that that scripture does not cancel out every other scripture in the book of God about baptism, about believing, about the new birth. You can't take John 3.16 and just cancel everything else out. That doesn't cancel your debt. You can't simply acknowledge that Jesus Christ existed, was a person, was born. You can't say, I believe and, and everything else is done. No, your sins are still with you until you get to the water. Your sins are still there. They're not gone. They've not been canceled. The debt's still there. The penalty's still there. You see the danger of living in a world where people are not baptized. Paul thought it was so, so important that he said, or I should say Peter said 
in 1 Peter 3, 21, he said, even now baptism doth now also save us. So we take John 3, 16, we're going to cancel out Peter. We just cancel him out. And the same John that said John 3, 16, four chapters later, said, if any man is thirsty, let him come. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, as the Scripture has said, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. What was he talking about? This spake he of the Spirit, they that believe upon him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. You can't take John 3, 16, cancel everything else out and say it's not necessary. But what are you talking about? We're saved by grace, yes. But don't take that scripture out of context, please. We are saved by grace, but that not of itself. Faith, we're saved by grace through faith and that not of itself. It's the gift of God. So faith is what makes grace work. If there's no faith... There can't be no grace. But if you got faith, where do I get faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except he be sent? So when we get up here and start preaching, that's our job is to preach. Our job is to teach. Our job is to get the faith working in you so that it generates conviction. And when conviction is generated, that will generate repentance. And repentance generates conversion. In the water, you lose those sins and leave them behind. Our jo- that's our job. I hate to use the term job, but that's our responsibility is to teach every creature. Every creature. Where'd you get that from? Go ye into all the world and teach. How many? Every creature. Every creature. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. When when Jesus said that, he didn't tell them boys up on the mountain. There was only 11 of them there. It wasn't the whole world was out there. Just 11. He wasn't telling them, go and repeat my words. He wanted them to go and fulfill his words. And thus on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter did exactly as he had been instructed. And it was Peter that had the authority to do it because Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. This, this, should, be, this should be instinctive for Pentecostal believers. This doctrine here, I'm going to tell you, when people talk about, they come in and they try to find all the, well, I've got the Greek exergesis here and I've got a Hebrew, blah, blah, blah. We go through all that stuff. Thing. We're impress people. You come out and start preaching just old basic fundamental doctrine of the New Testament church, you get my attention. When somebody reads Acts 2.38, I want to stand up and salute because that's where salvation comes into your life. Amen. This word is infallible. You can't go wrong. I liked what old Reverend Ike used to say. He'd say, you can't lose with the stuff I use. Of course, the stuff he was using was worthless back in the 60s. He made millions of dollars with that that stuff. Come on. He dressed like a crazy man and had money falling out of his pockets. He had money everywhere, but he didn't preach nothing. And he'd always tell people, you can't lose with the stuff I use. About 45 years ago, I picked that up and I said, you know, I can really say that. Ike couldn't, but Mike can. I just put an M in front of Ike and made it right. I can say it. You can't lose with the stuff I use. Your grandpa, you can't lose with the stuff that he used. That's taken him to a dozen different continents. That's taken him all over the world and other places preaching the same message everywhere no matter what the language is. People are finding out. Now we're starting to see a little little revival of this this water and and this baptism and this name of Jesus. You see, this is going to have to be, I said this before, I'm going to say it again. If this ain't a sanctuary church, it's not a church. It's just a building with a few people in it. 
It's got to be a sanctuary. It's got to be a place where people can go and seek refuge, where people can go and feel safe. You've got to feel like you're safe here. They're going to come, Connie. They're going to come because this world's going to hell in a handbag, and it's going faster than we can imagine. And we're going to have to have a place because when they start coming, they're not going to come one or two at a time. It's not going to be any trickle down here. They're going to come in numbers, and they're going to sit down, and they're going to say, I don't have no place else to go. My church has failed me. My government has failed me. My friends have failed me. My relatives have failed me. I've got to find some place where there's a safety net. I've got to find some place that's a refuge. How do I know that the church will be a sanctuary? I'll tell you how. The Bible said the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runneth there too and is safe. You find safety only in the name of Jesus. So only in a church where the name of Jesus is proclaimed and preached, where you're baptized in that name and you believe in that name and you're hoping everything is in that name. That's where you'll find safety and that's where you'll find a refuge. Amen. Nowhere else. Watch these churches. They're closing by the droves. These churches that used to be, oh, thousands of people. They don't have no message. Oh, they got great music. Whew, son, that hill song, they could surely get some pretty music. But I'll tell you, their preachers wasn't worth nothing in Cuban money. No anointing, no power of God, nothing. Just a feel good, rub me on the back, stroke me on the head, pat me on the head like a puppy and say, did you enjoy the service today? Wasn't it good, the singing was blah, blah, blah. You don't need all that stuff. What you need, what you need is to feel something in your body. You need to feel something in your heart. Feel something deep down inside of you that you know is real. Something that'll take you through a storm. There'll be a place of safety, a refuge. You'll have a genuine relationship with God that nobody can take away from you. We don't have to have a building. We don't need that building, this building, or any other building. If it comes down to it, we'll go back to the tent or go hide in the woods or do it in our living room, but we'll have the name of Jesus Christ. We'll have the strong tower, and that's what people are going to have to have, and it's what they're going to want. No more foolishness. We're past all of that. I, for one, I hate the term I am tired, but I am. I'm tired of John 3.16 canceling out the rest of the Bible. Just cancels it out. Don't worry about anything. Do that and you're okay. No, you are not. No, you are not. I told a minister today, I said, he's a young fellow. I said, son, I want to tell you, if you don't have love, mercy, and humility in your life, you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. No matter what they tell you, what they've told you, or what they've made you believe, if you do not exemplify love, mercy, and humility, you do not have the Spirit of Christ in you. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement. Well, don't blame me for it. Go back and blame Solomon. Solomon's the one that said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I heal their land. Then will I forgive their sin. That humility has to be present. Humility is a prerequisite to any relationship with God. If humility's not there, you don't have a relationship. Well, I did this. It doesn't matter what you did. Can I tell you that if humility is not present in your life, then pride is. And God is not only not listening to you, he will not have a relationship with you. He is actively, that is a military term in the Greek, that he is actively, actually fighting against you. He resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. No other way. Nine spiritual gifts, all of them separate and distinct. Nine components of the fruit of the one spirit. There's only one spirit. God is that spirit. Only one and there are nine components to that fruit, singular. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's, that's what it is, nine components. They say bananas are good, good for potassium. 
you need potassium. So if you get a banana peel and start eating the banana peel, you, you, that's not where you're not going to help you. You have to have the other part of that piece of fruit because that fruit is comprised of, it's got them little strings on it. Don't you hate them things, especially when you get one in your mouth and you can't get it out and you, your tongue's working overtime trying to get rid of it. That's part of it. And when you peel an orange, you got to get all those little strings off of it and you got all that other stuff. You got seeds, you're trying to avoid the seeds. You got the cores, you got all that stuff. That's part of the orange. All of that is a part of the orange, but it's the meat of the orange. So you see, when you talk about love and joy and peace and long-suffering gentleness and goodness, faith and, and meekness, all of those things are components of that one fruit. That whole piece of fruit is comprised of all of those things. That's why you can't say, well, I've got a couple of them. It, it just, folks... It's not possible, it's not practical, and it just will not work like that. And the reason you need to know what I'm telling you here tonight, you need to get this. Go back and listen to this. Write these scriptures down. Pay attention to this because people's questions are answered when you give them this. This leads people to the altar. It may not make them feel good and jump up and click their heels and want to write out a check for $10,000, but this here will change their lives. This is what will make them part of the body of Christ. There is such a, a gross misunderstanding of the body of Christ. Uh, man, I mean, when you talk about the body of Christ, you're not talking about just a group of people here, a group of people there, and blah, blah, blah. You're talking about the body right here on earth. He is gone in physical form, but his body is the church. We are that body. We are the body of Jesus Christ here on earth. We have to exemplify that. We have to act like that. People need to find, we need to know things. My people are just destroyed for lack of knowledge. Don't come to church just so you can hear a good sermon on Sunday and tickle your toes a little bit and go home feeling good and then not even know what happened while you was there. Get this stuff and get it inside of you. You know why that's so important, Nick? David said, Lord, your word, I hid it in my heart. I hid your word in my heart. He was not talking about the Bible. They didn't have a Bible. He was talking about the literal, genuine word. He knew who the word was. He knew that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus Christ, you say, wasn't there. No, he wasn't there in that bodily form we know. But the lamb, he was there before the foundation of the world. The word was with God and was God. See this package that God's got? We've tried to divide it up and butcher it down to the ground. You can't do it. That word, David, that's what he was talking about. I got that thing that was before the foundation of the world. I got that lamb, that sacrificial lamb and the blood, all of that. I got that in my heart. If I get that in there, I won't sin against you, God. Can I tell you that here we are today, and we know what the Bible says. If we'll listen to the voice of God and do the things that God tells us, there is no weapon formed against us that can hurt us. There's nothing they can vote in or vote out. The Supreme Court has a level. It's reached it. It can't go no higher. But there's a court that's above that. There's a name that's above that. There's a power that's above that. I don't care how many missiles Russia has or China has. There is a name that is above everything every name at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is what just what he said up there a while ago I am the Lord that's who's with you I am the Lord it was me in Egypt it was me at Calvary it was me when they're going to come back it will be me 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 always I will be with you and nothing can hurt you what we've done Jim is we've created a lot of confusion people are confused well, I talked to Aunt Myrtle. She's been this, that, or the other her whole life. That's all right. That doesn't make it right. You know how many Aunt Myrtles we've had to pass up? You have to have this truth. The Bible said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's turn that around. If I don't have the truth, am I free? If I have freedom, I got to know the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man can get where he needs to be except through me. 
I'm the only way. So if you don't have Jesus on the inside, rest assured you ain't got him on the outside. He has to be on the inside. He told his disciples, I am with you and you know me because I'm here. I'm in bodily form. But I'm leaving. But when I come back, I'm coming in another manner. I'm going to be different altogether. They couldn't grasp it. They did not know what he was talking about. They didn't realize that he was coming back, not in that bodily form. He was going to come back when the wind blows. It was that upper room experience was different than anything they had ever imagined. They didn't dream. They didn't know what they were waiting on. It's easy for us to sit over in the, in the peanut gallery and talk about how much we know and what we would have done and blah. We'd have done this. I'd have done that. You don't know what you'd have done. Most of you probably would have went home. You wouldn't have stayed there ten days. But those that waited, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Robbie. The joy of the Lord. So when you renew your strength, you renew your joy. And the joy is that joy unspeakable and full of glory that he talked about. That's what it's all about. So when you get him on the inside, now that spirit, that one spirit, that one Lord, that one faith, that one baptism, baptism that's outlined in Scripture has now become part of you. Every person, you that are here tonight, if you, if you were baptized by him, I, can, I, I think I, I can safely say I know he baptized you the right way. I taught him the right way. But if you ask most people to this, they say, well, I've already been baptized. Well, how were you baptized? Well, I don't know. In water. Well, was it a bowl or a pool? Was it a river or glass? What was it? Well, it's in the water. I got down in the water. Do you remember what they said? 85 to 90% of the people that you ask that do not know what was said over them when they were baptized. Because it's not that important to them. They were taught that, that it's not that important but, you know, did you know that by the law of the United States and here in Texas as well, that if, if you get married, you go and you go before a preacher, a judge, somebody that has the authority to marry you. Did you know that legally in Texas, until that preacher says, I now pronounce you man and wife, you're not legally married. Guess it does make a little difference what they say. Yeah. Did you know? It's your wife. I thought so, but you always ask. Nowadays, you never know. She, whatever you own, half of it's hers. It's called community property. Every, yeah, he's not going to argue. He's not setting himself up for nothing. <laughs> he's catching me before I can get too far. So you're not putting me in no trap, buddy. I got to go home with this woman. If she went to the bank tomorrow and said, I want to borrow $5,000 in my husband's name, they say, okay, we'll just go get it. No, they'd get some papers, and they'd ask a bunch of questions, and when they get through, they'd say, what's your husband's name? Right? Right. What's your husband's name? They're not going to just give it to nobody, this, this anonymous person. What is the name? Why? The name is important. The name represents authority. The name represents power. The name represents ownership. Amen. Everything has to be titled. It's got to have a name. That's why when Jesus said, go and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, they understood what he was saying. And when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, you know, if you're going to use what the world says, then Peter contradicted Jesus. Because Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why would he say that when Jesus said, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Because Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were not names. They were titles. You got children? You have children? You're a father. But that's not your name. You got a wife. You're a husband. That's not your name. You got a father. But you're not a father. You're, I mean, you're a son. But that's not your name. You have a name, and that's what Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, Jesus, and when Peter gets up, he says, baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because John, 4, John 5, 43 said that he's come in his Father's name. What name did he come in? 
He came in the name of Jesus Christ. So that was the name that represented the Father. He said, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, and the Son, thou shalt bear a son and call his name Jesus, for he shall save their people from their sins. Peter actually knew that there was only one Spirit, that Jesus Christ represented that one Spirit, that there was only one Lord, Jesus Christ represented that one Lord. There was only one God, Jesus Christ represented that one God. He represented all of that. He knew that. He knew that the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit was not three names, but one name, the name Name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow every tongue should confess he understood that and that's why he pronounced with those keys now once he used those keys whatever he loosed on earth correct me if I'm incorrect whatever Peter loosed on the day of Pentecost was loosed from then on can't change it. Nobody has the authority to change it. First, first Corinthians, first Corinthians, first Corinthians. That's a new book in the Bible. I just invented it. First Corinthians 14 says that God is not the author of confusion. There's no confusion here. Paul wasn't confused. He preached this. James wasn't confused. He preached this. All of the epistles were written by men who preached what I'm preaching tonight. All of them. Right to the letter. Every one of them preached it. They believed it and they died for it. So folks, what can wash away my sins? You think it's the water? No. 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 You got your book out there, your Bible there, Jim? Go to 1 Peter 321. A lot of things that we do are symbolic. It's symbolic. But you see, it's obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And to listen is better than the fat of the ram. Pay attention. Listen. To obey is better than sacrifice. Read me what it says in verse 321. Not, not removal from the dirt, not that that water washed off dirt, not that. But an appeal to God. But appeal to God. For a good conscience. A good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism clears the conscience. It, it generates conviction. That's what causes you to repent. And without, except you repent, you know what happens? You perish. All of these things that I'm talking about here tonight are things that save us. This is us. This is who we are. We're nothing else. We should not want to be anything else. Listen to this. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Woo. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll overcome. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll reach my home. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory, glory, this I sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my praise for this I bring, nothing but the blood of Jesus will save us. Hide that in your heart. Get it in there. Because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is in your heart, stored away there. That's what's going to be making you talk. About. That's what you're going to talk about. That's why you see more guys talking about football and baseball and basketball and all and fishing and hunting and guns and all that other junk. 
Instead of talking about the love of God and the blood of Calvary and the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit, they've got something else hidden in their heart. But if you get this hidden in your heart, everybody ought to read their Bible every day. You ought to read it through the whole, every year. You ought to be reading it, studying it. Now, especially as the time draws near, we've got to know what's in that book. Keep teaching it, Nick. Keep teaching it, son. Don't back up an inch. Don't take no water from nobody. Teach it. If they don't like it, let them go somewhere else. Preach it to them. If they don't have this, they're not going to get out of here. I'm smart enough to know I'm going to leave family behind. Kills me, man. I can't hardly think about it. But I watch them. And they're not interested. The Bible means nothing to them. They're so caught up in all of this. If the devil ever, ever did anything, did a good job on anything, well, he's done a good job on tricking us. That's why hell has enlarged herself. And our numbers have shrunk. Most of the people that you think are saved are not. Not according to the book. And that's all we have to go by. Amen. Nothing else. So let's stand if you would. I want to try to encourage you. Don't do less for God. Do more. Amen. These Wednesday nights... I used to work hard to have something for midweek services, we used to call it, because I knew the people that came on Wednesday night were a little bit more serious than the ones that came on Sunday morning. And the ones that come to a prayer meeting are more serious than the ones that come on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. And the people that show up when you don't ask them to, and, hey, I can do this, I'll do that. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah what do you need me to do? That's how you determine the wealth of a relationship and the value of a relationship. It's based on your actions on what you do. Y'all have got a tremendous opportunity here. Your debt's not that great by comparison to people today. There are people that have bigger house payments than what y'all are going to have for your buildings. You've got a nice place. You've got land out here. You're kind of separated from everything else, but it's easy to get to. You have a great opportunity to be a sanctuary. Amen. Help me, God, to be a living sanctuary. And help us, God, to be a sanctuary church that when they come, we'll have what they need. There won't be no food shortage here. There won't be no food shortage here. I don't mean physical food, spiritual food. Amen. That's going to matter. It's going to matter. This is not a time to back away, find fault, get mad at somebody, don't speak to somebody. Well, they didn't shake my hand. They didn't sing the song I like. Put all that garbage out of your mind. It's not worth it. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We're blood-bought. Nothing more, nothing less. We are blood-bought. And the blood of Jesus is what makes this what it is. Amen. Nothing more. Well, I leaned over to Pastor Nick and I said, well, somebody's typing something now or somebody's doing something now. He opened up the door for Bible studies. Amen. So, uh, no, what a word. And, of course, we teach, we teach this throughout the year. God, yes, give the Lord a hand. We, we teach on this. We believe this. We teach it throughout the year. Uh, Pastor Nick does, we do once a year where he goes about 16 weeks of teaching pretty much in depth on every area that uh, our church believes our, our systems or rather our doctrines and so I encourage you not to just not to just take something you hear and go oh wow that's great uh, not just to go oh man you, you know a lot of people they'll go online and they'll watch somebody or they'll see something those people don't they're not sowing into your community they're not sowing into your life they're not by your people your family's deathbeds they're not doing their funerals they're not praying with them in the hospitals they're not baptizing them they're not doing anything they just put a blurb out there to get your attention and if they draw draw your affection so easily, then you're in danger of what he prophesied the end time would be like, that people would blow with every wind of doctrine. So when that wind of doctrine begins to blow, make sure you're grounded and you're rooted because there's a lot of doctrines out there. And we don't pretend to know everything. 
We just want to follow the Holy Ghost because the Bible says that the Holy Ghost will lead us and guide us in all truth. And so we just want to follow him through every door, every door that's open. God, I want to follow through. But the only way we can be sensitive to that is through prayer and fasting. I don't want you to be blown by every wind of doctrine. So the things that, that he taught on tonight, uh, if you'll notice, he, my, I'm similar in style in terms of uh, lacing everything I say with Scripture. I try not to use a ton of extra biblical references because I believe it's more important to make sure that you understand that the Bible is infallible. And the, if we make one part of the Bible questionable, then all of the Bible is questionable. If we dismiss one portion of the Bible, we've got to dismiss the whole Bible. Be careful of anybody that tries to draw you away with some extra spiritual understanding or some esoteric understanding or knowledge that they may have that, that's, oh, well, I got it from here, I got it from there. If it got, listen, the Holy Bible, if it's in error, if there's one part of it that's an error, hear me real closely, anybody watching, if one part is an error, the entire Bible is an error. Amen. Be careful. This is why we do Wednesday nights. This is why we do home Bible studies. This is why we want to make sure we get the word hid in our heart. Amen. Would you not agree? How many of you got word tonight? Anybody got word tonight? Amen. So y'all make sure y'all make sure y'all thank my father, and it's good that Paul is here. I called her the other day. I said, where you been? Of course, y'all be praying. We prayed for her the other day, but y'all make sure y'all continue to pray for her. I think she's doing better by being here. She did something real smart and kind of fell down a mountain or something and broke some ribs. And so, <laughs> thankfully, she's only 39, so she overcame pretty quickly. But uh, y'all keep them in prayer, and y'all thank my father for being here. God bless you. We're going to dismiss in prayer, but I'm so glad that you are here. And I hope that you... Remember the announcements? There was one that I remembered that I said I needed to make sure I reminded you. And, and well, that's another birthday gift. Amen. Some older people know, right? Every year you get a birthday gift, like one less memory. Okay, that didn't go very well. <laughs> the younger one's going, huh? Uh, but uh, so anyway, let's go to God in prayer right now. Hey, oh, yeah, I know what it was. I'm sorry. July 4th is this coming week, or this is July 4th weekend, this coming weekend. We have one service, 11 a.m. Share. When they do the flyers on there, if you're on Facebook or any other, or Instagram or any of those social media, share that. Make sure you call people, invite them to come. We've been having great services on Sunday. We've been right at 100 mark or more every single Sunday for the last three months. And so there's only been a couple where we didn't hit even in the 90s, so God's really, and I know that doesn't, we're not saying it's about numbers, but the more we can get the message out, and it's like every week somebody's wanting to be baptized because we've been talking about baptism a lot, we've been teaching on it, amen, and so um, it's not just about getting somebody in baptism, we want to get them to an altar of repentance, and then, you know, there's a, there's a step forward, but you can't do anything, you can't be saved without repentance, just remember that. Um, so we, we are so thankful. So remember, July 4th weekend, I may preach on freedom. Who knows? And, and I may say something about the Supreme Court's decision because I've been asked by a bunch of po folks in our church. So I may say it on Sunday so it'll just eliminate a lot of people that don't like to read. <laughs> study to show yourself approved, right? We keep it in Scripture, and we never study the history of our country. That's why we're repeating junk. We've been now, we're starting to repeat because we, okay, let's move on. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is awesome. It cuts going in, cuts coming out. God, I thank you, Jesus, for the truth that you've revealed to us. I thank you for the preaching word and the, ta the teaching tonight that we received. God, I ask that everyone that watched, everyone that will watch, and God, everyone in this room, God, that something cut to their hearts and that they'll make a decision to even go further and deeper in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you.